Hey guys, welcome back. This is Tin Man. Today I'm going to talk to you about how dangerous it is to be a wildlife photographer. I'm going to share with you seven big mistakes that I've made in the last 10 years as a wildlife photographer so that you don't make the same mistake that I've made and hopefully it could save your life. So let's begin. By the way, this is Tin Man Lee. I have been doing wildlife photography for the last 10 years. And currently I'm an invited judge for nature photographer of the year and bird photographer of the year. So just how dangerous it is to be an outdoor photographer. So recently there were two bear attacks. If you are going to see bears, definitely go with a group of friends. You should always carry bear spray. And if you are going to places like Alaska, definitely hire a professional bear guide. From talking to a lot of professionals who have experience with bears, they are more aware of black bears than grizzly bears because black bears are just more unpredictable. So I have to tell you one of the most dangerous moments not happening to me but to some of my photographer friends near me in Alaska. When you are wading in water, sometimes it's not rock that are underneath, it could be mud. And there are places where the mud was really sucky. When you put your feet on, it gets very difficult to lift your feet because it pull you down. I don't know if you guys have watched the new Predator movie where there was a scene when the main character was stuck in those sucky mud. And indeed, I heard that some people died because when they got stuck in the mud, they couldn't get out. And then suddenly the tides come in and they just got drowned. What happens is when you step in, all your weight is on one foot and then the mud suck you in and when you try to lift your feet, you lost your balance and so you fell down. And once you fell down, you can never get back up again because both of your feet now are stuck. I saw some of my friends photographing a bear from a distance and the bear keep walking closer. And I was like, how come they are not moving away? Because the bear seems to be getting closer. And later the bear just walked towards them a little bit and walked to the other direction. And later I asked them, like, what happened? And then they told me that they got stuck in the sucky mud. So how do you avoid that is to keep moving your feet very quickly. And I would say that when you feel like the mud is sucky, you just keep moving. You can't just stay in one position because every second you delay yourself, you get sucked down a little bit more and it's much more difficult to get back out. I did an interview with an experienced professional bear guy. You can check on the link below. Moose kills more people in Alaska every year than bears. So be very careful when you're photographing moose, especially when they're in the mating season. When male moose are fighting with each other for the ladies, if one of them lost the fight, they are so angry, they may see you as a target to attack you. So is it dangerous to photograph in cold weather? Deep snow can be very dangerous. One year I was driving in Yellowstone. I saw a river otter near a river and snow was falling. The forest was beautiful. I can foresee a beautiful photo. So I quickly parked my car. I got out of the vehicle. There was a slope before I could get to the river. So without any hesitation, I sit on the snow and just slide myself down to get a photo of the river order. Unfortunately, the river order has already gone. I had to climb back up. The slope was about seven feet high to get back onto the road. And every time I step two or three steps, I slid down. I repeated quite a few times and I couldn't get back up. And that's when I realized that, oh crap, there were not really many people driving on the road. And even if they're on the road, they would not see me. It was late in the evening and I may be stuck there for the whole night and I would probably die. But fortunately, I was with my friend Devin and Devin was a lot more agile than me. He was down there as well and he was able to climb back up. He tried to pull me up for a few times and I still couldn't get back up. And at the end, I just back up for 20 feet and then I just sprint towards the slope and then just jump up and then he held my hand and pulled me up there and that's how I got out. If I were to do it again, I would make sure that I would go with a friend and second, in those places there were no phone signals. So you gotta have some device that can get satellite signals such as the in-reach device. I think the new iPhone may have those lights 
surface in the future. One thing that is very important about deep snow is you don't know how deep it is, and you don't know if there are any other vegetable, not vegetables, any vegetation and stuff like that in the snow. Then if you just walk over there, you may just drop, and if you submerge under the snow, you may not be able to breathe. A friend of mine was trying to photograph some owls, and he was hiking in this deep snow. One of the steps, there were some. Tree root that is like this shape, and then his feet just got right underneath the root, and then the next step it was a very steep slope. So because of that, he lost balance, and then he fell down. But one of his foot was still stuck in the root and snap. And broke his foot right there. When you're walking in this deep snow, every step instead of immediately lifting your other feet to walk forward, you actually put some weight onto your front foot to tap on it to see if the ground is solid before you walk, so that you can make sure that you are safe. Here is a video of me and my friends walking in deep snow, trying to follow an American marten in Yellowstone. So the coldest I have been was in the Canadian Arctic, where the wind was minus 50 Fahrenheit. Any time when it is under minus 20, always wear a face mask, a balaclava, and a heavy-duty hat to protect your face. I still remember the lodge owner told us that a few years ago there was a photographer who wanted to photograph polar bear, and they were in a vehicle. And when they saw the polar bear, he immediately got out to try to photograph the polar bear. He didn't have time to put on his gloves, and he thought that a few seconds outside wouldn't. Be any problem? Even though the people say, "Hey, you gotta get back into the vehicle," he said, "Oh, let me just take a few more photos." Then, with that few extra seconds, when he went back into the vehicle, his thumb turned black, and later he had to be airlifted to the nearest hospital to have the thumb amputated. So that is how serious. So, what can you do in this kind of cold weather? Of course, cl clothing is very important. You just have to wear lots of layers, and I would. Wear something called bib on the outer layer instead of just snow pants. The reason is when the wind was blowing, the wind can blow from underneath your belly up, and it got really cold. So with a bib, it blocks all the wind from there. When I was photographing wolves with a few friends, and we were waiting. For the wolves, for hours and hours in the snow, I was freezing. The hand warmer turned wet, and it didn't work. And a new friend, Peter, he said, "Hey Tim, man, you gotta try this." And then he gave me this thing called the electronic heat hand warmer, and it was really warm. So I highly recommend you guys get that. It's rechargeable, and it gets warm very quickly, and it's waterproof. I have all the links for my cold weather gear down below, so definitely check it out. So this one time, I was with my good friends trying to photograph bison in Yellowstone. We saw a herd of bison on the side of the road, and so we just pull to the parking lot nearby, and then we just walk like a hundred feet trying to photograph the bison. Nothing can go wrong, right? Within a few minutes, the weather turned worse, and there was a full-on snowstorm. And I couldn't see it. it just got. Wiped out immediately. The wind was so strong; it blew up all the snow and blasted it right onto my face. It felt just like hot coal, like when you are doing barbecue and when those hot particles got onto your face. It was like a splash of those on your face. I couldn't open my eyes. Imagine if the snowstorm lasted for a day; I would not be able to even get back to my car. So definitely check weather forecast before you go anywhere. And when you see those kind of things happen. Just quickly try to get back to your vehicle. Another thing about cold weather is sometimes it will form ice on the road and it's really slippery. And when you're carrying heavy lenses, heavy camera, and if you fell down, all these lenses and camera can be broken. No matter how good your balance is, one thing that you can get is those black diamond brand spikes traction device. You put it underneath your hiking boot, and it really helps. Driving in the snow is extremely dangerous. Snow tires is a must, and four-wheel drive is also a must. A heated 
Steering wheel is also pretty nice and heated seat. Anyways, even with all this, uh, it can still be dangerous. One year, the vehicle tried to pass our van. By the time he changed direction to the left lane, the car lost control and just drove straight off the road. When I was in Yellowstone, there were quite a few times that I got quite scared when there were heavy snow and there were white outs and I barely could see anything. And the worst thing is when you got into a wrong direction and you try to make a three-point turn to make a U-turn, you never know how much space you have on two sides of the road. And if by accident you just got a little bit too much, you felt off the road and in those weather, rescue is very difficult. So one year I drove before dawn trying to get into the park to look for wolves and the snow was pretty heavy. On my way, I saw one vehicle in front of me got stuck and the reason it got stuck was because it didn't have a high clearance and the snow in front of the vehicle just keep getting piled up and at the end, the snow got so high that the vehicle was lifted up and all the four wheels was off the ground. Later, they have to send in tow trucks to so how about photographing in the mountains? At the time I had the nine to five job. So I just flew in red eye the night before and then I drove all the way to the mountain. So basically from Los Angeles to the 14,000 feet summit of the mountain where you can drive up is less than 12 hours. And the moment when I saw a mountain goat on the side of the road, I got too excited. So I got out for two, 300 meters and then my body wouldn't function after that. Feeling was like you had drink a lot of alcohol and that is the moment right before you're gonna puke. I don't know why I know that. One photographer came over to me and said, hey, are you okay? And I look at him and couldn't answer because I know that if I say anything, I'm gonna puke. It was embarrassing and my feet was shaking. So I would say drink a lot of water when you're going to high altitude place and you get the acclimatization, which is at least to spend a day or two to get adapted to the high altitude before you even go out. So you may say, Tin Man, doing outdoor photography is so dangerous. Why are you still doing it? My whole life, I was living in the city. But ever since I went to nature, I realized I learned more about my limits. I feel great. I realized that, oh, wow, I didn't even know that I could survive through this. Being able to spend these special encounters with wild animals really brings me happiness. So I hope that you enjoy this video. Next time when you go out, hope you don't make the same mistakes as I did. If you have any crazy experience in the wilderness, definitely leave it in the comments and I'll make sure to reply to you. So see you next time.